25 years after the practice was outlawed, why are lakhs of manual scavengers still forced to carry out the dehumanizing job of clearing human excreta? The Kerala High Court orders a medical test to verify a 25-year-old's assertion of being a transgender person. It's a violation of a Supreme Court judgment, some argue. And the only country in the world that bans its women from driving is finally gearing in for change, even as the women who ask for that change remain in jail. It's Wednesday, June 6th. Don't be disgusted when you look at me, says this appeal by members of the transgender community appointed as employees of the Kochi Metro. Kerala was lauded for its many initiatives empowering the transgender community, including setting up of the country's first transgender support cell. But battling the social stigma associated with the third gender remains tough. The Kerala High Court has, controversially, ordered the psychological and medical examination of a 25-year-old despite the person having identified as a transgender. This order came on a habeas corpus petition filed by the mother of the transgender person. The petitioner, refusing to accept that her son, A.B. James, has identified as a transgender, told the court that he was diagnosed with mood disorder psychotic features and that he had changed his name to Arundhati under the influence of and coercion by his transgender friends. What is a habeas corpus petition though? Habeas corpus is a provision in law that provides protection against unlawful and arbitrary detention. A habeas corpus petition requests the court to order the individual or agency, mostly the police or law enforcement, who has custody of the person to produce that person in the said court which is why the Kerala High Court's move has come under criticism. In this case, remember the person is not a minor and has declared and asserted themselves as a transgender person of their own free will. In a landmark judgment in 2014, referred to as the Nalsa judgment, the Supreme Court had recognized transgender people as a third gender. Importantly, the Apex Court ruled that transgender persons' right to decide their self-identified gender is also upheld and that the centre and state governments are directed to grant legal recognition of their gender identities such as male, female or as third gender. Which is to say, an individual has the right to declare themselves as whatever gender it is they identify with. No medical examination or certificate is required and it is not mandated that a person undergo sex reassignment surgery. Two years later, drawing from the court's directives, the government drafted the Transgender Rights Bill. This bill though has come under intense criticism for diluting the Supreme Court judgment. Two of the most contentious aspects are, one, the definition itself of a transgender person in the bill, and two, the proposed law mandates the setting up of a screening committee that will decide who is a trans person. This is in contravention of the Supreme Court judgment. That itself is problematic because there will be a medical doctor, there will be a psychologist who will actually assess uh, us and decide whether we are trans or not. So the Nalsa judgment of 2014 uh, what it said was that everyone will have a right to decide whether they are, you know, what their gender is, whether they identify as trans or man or woman. Uh, that right only resides with with the person, the trans person. What about what about trans people whose uh, preferred gender, the gender that they see themselves in, the gender of choice, is also something that fits within the binary. So if if I was assigned gender female at birth and I go by a screening committee, they're going to say I'm transgender. No, but the gender that I want on my documents is man, because I'm a man. Kakkus, Divya Bharti's powerful 2017 documentary on manual scavenging was disturbing to watch. Think of those who have to do that dehumanizing job of clearing human excreta every day. Exactly 25 years ago, in June 1993, a law was passed prohibiting the practice of manual scavenging of human refuse. A quarter of a century later, the practice continues, 
and the promised rehabilitation of those engaged in manual scavenging remains unfulfilled. The Prohibition of Employment as Manual Scavengers and their Rehabilitation Act 2013 made the states responsible for identifying and rehabilitating manual scavengers by providing them training, giving assistance, loans and even houses. It further prohibits dry latrines and other forms of insanitary latrines. The failure of the promised rehabilitation has been marked by the state's refusal to acknowledge the numbers. Manual scavengers identified by the state is just 7% of the households with at least a single member engaged in manual scavenging, according to Census 2011. There are 1,82,505 households in rural India with at least one member doing manual scavenging, according to the 2011 census. Even if we assume there is only one person in those identified households doing manual scavenging, there are at least 1,82,505 manual scavengers in India. Further, the census enumerates there are 7,40,078 households where excreta is cleared by human beings. And so the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment has begun a new survey process from January this year. In the first phase, the proposed survey would be conducted in urban and rural areas of selected 164 districts in 18 states and would cover those engaged in the cleaning of dry latrines, the cleaning of open drains in which human excreta is flushed from insanitary latrines and manual cleaning of single pits attached to toilets. This process, when completed, it is hoped, will mean complete rehabilitation of those forced to carry out this dehumanizing and dangerous task. Another witness in the Sarabuddin Sheikh fake encounter case has turned hostile, taking the total number of hostile prosecution witnesses to 60. Let's remind you what the case is about. In 2005, Sarabuddin Sheikh, an alleged criminal, was gunned down by the Gujarat police, which accused him of having terror links. Curiously, his wife, Kausar B, had also gone missing. Sarabuddin's brother, Rubabuddin, approached the Supreme Court, seeking a probe into his brother's death. It was also claimed that a man, Tulsiram Prajapati, was a witness to the abduction and killing of Sarabuddin. Prajapati was also killed in an encounter a year later. It later emerged that Kausar B was dead and her body was burnt and disposed of. The CBI eventually took over the case under directions from the court and filed its charge sheet, naming among others then Gujarat Home Minister Amit Shah as an accused. Fifteen people have been discharged in the case so far, including Amit Shah, Gulabchand Kataria, then Home Minister of Rajasthan, and top cops like DG Vanzara and Rajkumar Pandian. Is there a connection of this case with that of the death of Judge Loya? Judge Loya died ostensibly due to a heart attack in December 2014 while in Nagpur attending a colleague's daughter's wedding. At that time, Loya was the CBI judge hearing the Sharabuddin Sheikh fake encounter case. Amit Shah was later discharged by the judge who took over the case after Loya's death. A journalistic investigation which included video testimonies of Judge Loya's family members published in the caravan in November 2017 raised questions of possible foul play in his death. In April this year, the Supreme Court dismissed a petition seeking an independent investigation into Judge Loya's death. This is Saudi Arabia's first female holder of a driving license. She is among the 10 women who were allowed to trade in their foreign driving licenses with Saudi ones on Monday. On June 24th, along with several other women across the country, she will finally be trusted to drive by her own country in accordance with Islamic laws. It is a moment of celebration for women who for years have been forced to rely on taxis or male relatives. Several of those who fought for it though remain behind bars. In recent months, at least 17 activists have been arrested for driving in Saudi Arabia, jailed and charged with undermining stability, even treason. Activists arrested on similar grounds are still serving sentences of 8 to 10 years in prison. But June 24th is huge for a nation that restricts women from studying, working or travelling without permission of a male guardian. Something that Vogue Arabia tried to celebrate. The magazine's June issue featured Princess Haifa bin Abdullah, daughter of the late Saudi king, calling her quote a driving force, celebrating the trailblazing women of Saudi Arabia. The cover expectedly earned huge backlash. 
tweets emerged with the princess's face replaced with the faces of arrested activists. Soon after, on Sunday, Saudi Arabia temporarily released eight of the arrested activists, but nine others have still not been released and face possible trial. June 24th is a milestone for the country. But how much of Saudi Prince Mohammed bin Salman's Vision 2030 that hopes to market the nation as more liberal and inclusive is for show? And what remains veiled? More tomorrow.